are aboard a cargo jet in the 22nd century. Here's a man we had trouble with in the hold, Lieutenant. What's his complaint? Well, he claims he's Mitchell Courtney, a copysmith star class with a father's shock and advertising company. He says he's been shanghaied aboard this jet. Roll up his sleeve. Let's see his social security tattoo. Uh... 1304-9974-1416-156-187723. Liar! Get him out of here! If he's with shock and advertising, he'd have a low number. Can't you see it's been altered? Let me use the radio and talk to Mrs. Shock and himself. <laughs> Where from, Mr. Courtney? The dead? Take a look at this copy of today's New York Times, dated February 17th, 2157. Mitchell Courtney, head of the Venus Rocket Project at the Fowler Shock and Advertising Firm, has been found dead in Little America. Now, wait a minute. A man by the name of Matt Runstead knocked me out there. But can't you see that I'm alive? I am Mitchell Courtney. <laughs> you can prove that after ten years. Ten years? My manifest shows that you're not an advertising man. You're only a consumer named George Groby. You've signed up for ten years' labor in Costa Rica. And those ten years begin as soon as this jet sets down. Take him back to the hold. The CBS Radio Workshop, dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. The CBS Radio Workshop continues part two of The Space Merchants by C.M. Kornbluth and Frederick Pohl. Today, the workshop resumes the story of Mitchell Courtney, Copysmith star class with the world's greatest advertising agency of the future, Fowler Shock and Associates. The tale of a rocket ride to Venus. <laughs> I lay on my filthy bunk in the hold of the cargo jet, trying to think of a way to get back to New York. I wanted to find out why Matt Runstead had knocked me out and had me shanghaied. Who wanted to get me off the Venus Project, the advertising campaign we dreamed up to colonize Venus? I wanted to get back to my wife, Kathy. But there was nothing I could do until this cargo jet landed in Costa Rica. You scum skimmers, get in line. Now, what's your name? Mitchell Courtney. Mitchell Court. Oh, yeah. You're the bum we had trouble with on the plane. Oh, sorry, my name is George Groby. Oh, that's better. What do you want to do here, Groby? Got any choice of job? Anything. Anything the sun drenched plantations of Costa Rica have to offer. I'm here to clasp the deft hands of independent farmers with pride in their work. I'm here to extract the juicy, ripe goodness of chlorella protein. Say, how'd you learn that? That's our prime impact commercial. Learn it, I wrote it. But don't let that stand in your way. Groby, you're not going to get anywhere being a wise guy. Yes, sir. You're assigned as a chlorella scum skimmer third class. Report for duty and assignment to a bunk at Tier 48 in Dormitory Z. <laughs> Heart of chlorella products is a strange, glutinous, ever growing organism called Chicken Little. It provides one third of the world with the protein that replaces old fashioned meat. It grows in huge, sweating vats. And only the constant slicing keeps it from overgrowing and covering Costa Rica and its neighbors, or in time, the face of the earth. I had written of its delights many times in the agency, but I now came to know it at first hand. I was assigned to skim the scum which dripped from its sides. <laughs> she stinks pretty bad, don't you, Jorge? <laughs> she's high, Herrera, she's high. <laughs> but she's beautiful, chicken little, eh, Jorge? Well, she's pretty awful. <laughs> Jorge, this is the first time I ever hear you say the advertisements are wrong. <laughs> uh, go into town with me tonight, eh, Jorge? <laughs> I'd made one friend, a master slicer named Herrera. 
He'd been aloof and standoffish at first, befitting his high station, but now he'd befriended me, done me a lot of favors. I didn't know why until that night we went on the town to a dark, almost empty cafe. Jorge, I have watched you very carefully. You don't belong here doing this work. Well, don't I? How am I ever going to get out? You have the brains, Jorge, not like the others. Oh, thanks. What good are brains here? I'm so tired half the time I can't think. Jorge, I'm going to put my life in your hands. Do you ever hear of the Concis? The Concis, of course. You know what the Concis stand for? Sure, World Conservation Association. I mean their ideas. Oh, I know you have heard they are dangerous. Well, they want a revolution. They want to go back to the old ways. Real meat, real grains and fruits. They want a break for the consumer, they say. Nothing in packages, nothing tested and guaranteed. Do you think they are so wrong? After six months here? Here, Jorge, take this pamphlet. Read it. Then talk to me again. Hmm? Or denounce me, I am not afraid. The Concy Underground opposed everything a self-respecting 22nd century advertising man like me believed. I would have denounced Herrera to the Chlorella authorities the next day, except for one thing. If I joined the Concy's first, if I learned their organization and secrets, I'd have a better bargaining position in getting back to New York. I joined them. The irony was the Concies were a lot better organized than I'd suspected, and after six months, they decided they needed me in New York. And it was they who engineered my return to the city. I returned to New York on a secret mission for the Concies. Two weeks after being in New York, I got the secret sign to attend a Concy meeting at the Metropolitan Museum. As my first taste of luxury in more than a year, I hailed a Cadillac pedicab and told the driver to take me to the Metropolitan Museum. You can't do better than to visit the Metropolitan Museum, mister. World's greatest masterpieces. Don't miss the painting on the first floor. It's called, I Dreamed I Was Ice Fishing in My Wonderform Bra. Yeah, I read it brought a million and a half. Not a cent less. And don't miss the theatrical collection. They got dancing cigarettes. Say, uh, you mind if we stop a second? These new Cadillac cabs are hard to pedal. Okay, get out. Oh, no, you don't. What's the idea of the gun? I recognize you when you walked out of Grand Central, Mr. Mitchell Courtney. What do you want with me? I want you to get out of the cab and come with me to the Taunton Agency. They've offered a big, fat, juicy reward for anybody who'll bring them the inside story of Fowler Shockin's Venus Rocket Project. And you're the boy who headed it up. So you're the boys who shanghaied me and got me off the project. No, we're not. I don't know who did. But we're sure glad we found you. The boy with all those nice secrets about colonizing Venus. Taunton wants those secrets. Come on, get out of here. <laughs> Drop that gun. Drop it or I'll break your neck. <laughs> I grabbed the gun and hit him behind the ear. Then I ran across Fifth Avenue and lost myself in a group of consumers on the sidewalk rolling back toward Shock and Towers. I jumped off and ran to the express elevator. I walked down the corridor to Shockin's office. It was dark and deserted. Then down the corridor, I saw light under my old office door. I walked up to it. I didn't knock. Hester. <gasps> Mitch! Oh, no. Hester, it's all right. I'm alive. Oh, but, but Mitch, they said you were dead. Who? Matt Runstead? Yes. Everyone believed him. Well, did my wife? Did Kathy believe him, Hester? Yes. Well, get her on the phone for me. Call her. Well, well, she's disappeared, Mitch. What? No one's been able to find her. After the news of your death, she just... Closed her office and disappeared. Maybe Shuckin knows where she is. Where is Shuckin, Hester? Well, he caught the moon rocket yesterday morning. He was going over your notes on the Venus Project. He's taking and... it over? Yes, from Matt Rudenstead. It was going badly, I'll Mitch. bet. 
Matt's trying to ruin our campaign. Hester, you've got to get me aboard the next moon rocket. Use the name George Groby. Runstead and the Taunton Agency will try to stop a man named Courtney. I've got a lot to tell, Mr. Shockin. <laughs> Passengers, this way, please. We are now on the moon. Tourists to the moon to the left, visitors on business to the right. Now, sir, name? George Groby, copy analyst, class four. Groby, copy analyst, four. Oh. God, yeah. this way, please. Yes, sir. This man says his name is George Groby. Fine. You're under arrest, Groby. Let go of me. I'm here to see Fowler Shockin. Mr. Runstead down on the earth told us to expect you. I don't know what you're talking about. You may be interested to know that your secretary, Miss Hester Barnes, is being tried for treason. Treason? She is charged with forging documents and passing them to you. The 43rd Amendment to the United States Constitution, treason to any registered advertising agency, is punishable by death. Hold him for the return passage and a similar charge, guard. The guard had his nightstick in my back as we walked down the streets. Past storefronts with signs, moon made fashions, stunning conversation pieces prove you were here. Souvenirs of Luna, cheapest in town. Moon suits rented 50 years without a blowout. Ye tasty goodie shop on ye moon. Warren Astron, readings by appointment only. Hold it. Huh? What is it? You sure your name's Groby? Positive. Ever know a man named Herrera? Well, yes, Herrera and I. <laughs> Wish we could find out what you're up to, Groby. Sent out of Costa Rica to report in New York, never show up at a meeting there. Then you turn up at Fowler Shockin's agency and get your passage on a moon you rocket. You mean you're a... Shut cons- up! Now go into Astron's there. He'll hide you till our top boss up here comes. First take my nightstick, knock me out with it, then point it at the streetlight and blast it out. Hit me hard, but not too hard. Oh, this is going to cost me two stripes in a week's pay. Oh. My concy training was really paying off. Astron took me in stride, hid me in a room under his floor, gave me something to eat, and I fell asleep. I waked with a light pouring down into my face. You can come up now, Groby. The chief is here to see you. In that room back there. I'll see you're not disturbed. Thanks. Over here, into the light, Mr. Groby. Kathy. Kathy, what are you doing here? Mitch, why didn't you stay on ice? What crazy thing have you done to turn up here? Go on. I'm crazy. Why shouldn't I be crazy? My wife, a kingpin concy. <laughs> what a shock. You, a star-class copysmith, married to a concy. Matt's one of you. You got Matt Runstead to Shanghai me. Mm, like a fool. I thought if I could get you away from Fowler's shock and I might bring you to your senses. Trying to decide what was best for poor little Mitch. Mitch, I loved you. You loved me. You actually were in love with me. Yes, I was, in spite of everything you stood for. But you are not going to talk to Fowler Shockin. I'm not. Mitch, I don't want you to ruin Venus the way you've ruined the world. A woman of ideals. What do you plan to do with me? Are you going to report to Fowler Shockin? Yes. Then there is nothing I can do for you. Then let me tell you something before you turn me over to Astron and your friends outside. I've been shanghaied, robbed of my name, forced to work like a slave in the tropics. I've had all I can take of others deciding what to do about poor old Mitch... Your guard friend left this nightstick with me. You know what he does, Kathy. Get on that phone and call Fowler Shockin and tell him where I am. Then get out. Take your friends with you. I'll give you two days to vanish. But this time, stay out of sight forever. Go on. Call Shockin. The 
This is Dr. Nevins, Mitchell Courtney's widow. I'd like to speak to Mr. Shockin, please. Mitch, my boy, I'm going to fatten you up and turn Venus section back to you. You know my policy. Find a good horse, give him his head, and back him to the limit. You've never let me down. And Venus section's in rotten shape. Nobody's applying for space on the Venus rocket. The whole campaign's at sea. The indices are down to 3.37 for North America. They should be four and rising. We've got to get those 1,800 consumers on board the Venus rocket. When we got back to Earth, Matt Runstead had disappeared. I arranged for Hester to be released from Alcatraz, and she returned in triumph in Shockin's private jet. I began to whip the Venus rocket project back into shape. I was living again, writing new jingles, starting new rumors by word of mouth, developing new techniques, until finally... Mitch, the big day has come. 1,800 consumers have volunteered to ride our rocket to Venus. Now, I've arranged for Congress to meet tomorrow. And, my boy, I want you to address them as Fowler Shockin's personal representative requesting a takeoff date. Gentlemen, the Senate is now in session. You all received a recording of the opening prayer last night. So let's hear from the senator from Chlorella Limited. Uh, the senator from Chlorella Limited passes in deference to the senator from Alaska Mining. The uh, senator from Alaska Mining passes in favor of the senator from United Steel and Smelting. The senator from United Steel and Smelting passes in favor of the senator from Caribbean Fruits. The senator from Caribbean Fruits passes in favor of the senator from Yummy Cola. My dear fellow senators, I thank you all for graciously allowing me to speak before we pass upon this very important bill concerning the Venus rocket. The people of this great republic of ours, extending from Atlantic seaweed to Pacific fish... Suddenly I sensed something had gone wrong. I had been sitting back thinking about Kathy, thinking of her face, her voice, her smile before we'd married. I was wondering where she was, what she thought of all this... Then the speaker's voice focused my attention upon him. I hadn't been worried. Fowler Shockin owned two-thirds of this gathering. But there was something about old yummy Cola that troubled me. He wasn't addressing his fellows. He was looking up, addressing me. A big grin on his face. I leaned forward just in time for the weenie. In a brief discussion I had before this session, Mr. Taunton gave me some information in private. But I feel it my public duty to ask a couple of questions of Mr. Courtney, who is present. I would like to ask Mr. Courtney if the name of George Groby is familiar to him. I would like to ask if Mr. Courtney is George Groby. I would like to ask Mr. Courtney if, when he was known as George Groby, he was a member in good standing of the World Conservationist Association, known to most of us loyal Americans as the country. Below, there was a raging tidal wave of taunting congressmen and shocking congressmen battling. For the first time in history, shots were being fired in anger on the Senate floor. If Taunton hadn't tipped off old Yummy Cola, I knew who had, the conscience. Somehow I didn't mind. I realized that for some time now, I'd really been one of them. A little man beside me dressed in black suddenly seized my arm and led me out the side door. You'll find a car outside ready to take you to the airport, Mr. Courtney. What airport? Don't stop to ask questions. Just go wherever you're taken. You'll be protected. Fat chance. You'll be all right. I guarantee that. Well, who are you? The president. Good luck. God bless you. I had to admire that little man's courage. He'd walked back into that raging den of lions without a quiver. Aboard the jetliner, I wondered what would happen to him when they found out he'd sent me to safety. Or was it to safety? I tried to ask questions of the men aboard the liner, but they looked the other way and kept absolutely quiet. Uh, 
You can climb out now, Mr. Courtney. They're all ready for you over there at the Venus rocket. There's no time to lose. Say, look here, I don't want to go to Venus. <laughs> Who's in charge here? I won't go aboard that rocket. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's aboard but you. Come on, Mr. Courtney. In you go. Last passenger, fasten them in for the takeoff. Last passenger, ready for the takeoff. Are you in here? Kathy. Kathy, where are you? Up here. Over your head. Stop floating around. Come down here and unfasten me. All right, I'll try. But we're beyond the law of gravity. We're on the way to Venus with 1,800 conservationists. How did you get out of a harness? A steward set me free, then floated away. I have to talk to you. <laughs> Me? You threatened to kill me, remember? Yes, I remember. You could have, Mitch, in time. But you never told Shokin who or where I was. Why didn't you? Because I love you, Kathy. And I think that for a long time I've been coming over to your side. And you're willing to face life on Venus? Yes. It's time people got a break. People? Not consumers. Oh, I like hearing you say that. And I love you too, Mitch. Oh, Mitch. Mitch, you broke my hold on your harness. Well, come back here. I just wanted to put my arms around you. Oh, there'll be plenty of time for that on Venus. Come back here. Unbuckle your harness and catch me. I can't. Uh, who invented this crazy gimmick anyway? Oh, oh Mitch. Mitch, you've stopped talking like an advertising man. Kiss me. The CBS Radio Workshop has presented part two of The Space Merchants, adapted for radio by Charles S. Monroe. Original music composed and conducted by Samuel Matlovsky. Produced and directed in New York by Paul Roberts. Stotts Cotsworth starred as Mitchell Courtney, Virginia Kay as Kathy. Others in the cast were Ralph Camargo, Leon Janney, Joseph Boland, Ian Martin, Jackson Beck, Ed Prentice, Joe Julian... Mary Patton, Bob Dryden, Ralph Bell, and Joe Helgeson. The sound effects were devised by Tom Buchanan and Tom Perkins, the engineer Jack Katz. This is Ted Pearson inviting you to listen again next week when from Hollywood, the CBS Radio Workshop presents The Engine No One Loved. It's the story of a Civil War locomotive that wound up its career in a children's amusement park. This is the CBS Radio Network.